Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Strictly Info Podcast. Like always, I'm your host, Khan. I'm here today with Shwini Poo, um, as you may know from every other, damn near every other podcast we do over here at the Strictly. Um, but a lot to talk about. Obviously, the Diggs trade went down, so we got Shwin on for his opinion on that and how it affects the Bills and all that stuff. And we'll tackle some other stuff like offensive tackles, um, some contract situations to cover on the league and, and things of that nature. But before we get into all that stuff, we do have a message from our sponsor, Bet Online. So, as you know, it's March Madness going on right now. We're down to the last four teams. Um, Bet Online has been, you know, kind of everybody's headquarters for for brackets and betting throughout this tournament for uh, the entirety of March. Now that we're down to the finals or nearly the finals, you still have a lot more in store from MLB, NBA, NHL playoffs. All that stuff is around the corner. Uh, and as always, Bet Online is the number one source for all your summer sports wagering. So you can head over there to Bet Online today to stay updated on all the action. Remember to use the promo code Believe, capital B L E A V, for a fifty percent off welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. And additionally, our new sponsor, Cut, is also sponsoring this podcast. So Believe Nation, as you all know, we've partnered with Cut, as you've heard on here before, the social betting platform. Cut is a peer-to-peer betting platform that allows you to bet directly against your buddies and other fans. And that's right. You could join the Believe crew on Cut today and bet directly against guys like me and Schwinn um, on all your favorite sports and even stuff like pop culture and political topics, which is crazy. So <laughs> Cut is the ultimate put your money where your mouth is test. Um, and it's legal here in New York. And I believe throughout the whole tri-state area. So also be sure to follow at CutBet on all social media channels and download the app. Um, use the code. Or okay, I'm gonna get that. Believe Nix. B L E A V Nix. Okay, B B L E A V Nix for a 10% deposit bonus. Jeez. All right. So without further ado, um, I think there's no other place to start this off besides talking about on Diggs, um, him getting shipped out of Buffalo and how that kind of really shook up everything in the AFC over there. So what do you what do you take from this mostly Schwinn? I want to get your thoughts first. Um I mean I would I was of the opinion that they were I was pretty confident last year towards the back half of the season after Brady took over that they were and I mean look you you look at what they did right they traded up for Kincaid last year in the draft. Um Kolo Shakir was a guy they didn't pick high, but was somebody that they were high on after his rookie season <clears throat> internally. And you just look at how the offense developed over the course of the year, especially once Brady took over. James Cook became a really big part of the offense. The running game was more prominent. Um, I mean, they even got a lot of usage out of guys like uh, like Ty Johnson, the guy they brought in the middle of the season. And he was actually, I mean, I loved the way he ran for us last year. Um, <clears throat> but they just the offense completely changed and Diggs went from like insane target shares to way more like yeah dude you're gonna get as many targets as Kincaid today or maybe Kincaid and and Shakir and maybe Cook one day and uh when you started seeing that you're like all right well you know it's probably time to start phasing Diggs out a little bit anyway right he's 30 um i know he had a monster start to the season last year but then i mean his last half was bad and yes sure some of that is schematic but i think some of that was also like hey um we've drafted i mean they drafted shakir cook and um and kincaid in the last two drafts when you invest capital especially kincaid and cook right first and second round pick in guys like that they need to become part of your they need to become pillars of your offense. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. Um, and if they're not, then usually that says like, all right, this guy's a bust. Right. Like, like you, we don't need to the like the I'm not even trying to rub this in with Jets fans, but like it's like, you know, when they drafted Je- Denzel Mims in the second round and then the guy couldn't get on the field, like at a certain point you just have to be like, all right, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's probably not trending well for the guy. Kincaid, obviously Cook, Shakir, these guys haven't had the problem of getting on the field but they were not getting targets because Dorsey's offense was very, very much like, okay, it's it's like a heliocentric NBA offense, right? Where it's just like, all right, no, Diggs is our best guy. So we're just going to feed Diggs. That's the offense. That's what we're trying to do. 
uh, and other guys are kind of window dressing to try to get digs open, but the entire point is to get is to get digs open. That was not the case under Dorsey, or, or sorry, under under Brady. He wanted to split and and use more variety, and and they, I mean, you saw the formations. They they used way more variety in formation uh, under Brady, and it wasn't just using different formations. It's how those concepts are layered. It's just a lot cleaner under Brady. Um, anyway, taking it back to the digs part of it, when you see that happening. I'd already assumed my assumption was like, all right, yeah, this is Diggs last year in Buffalo, whatever. Obviously you've got all this off field stuff, which we can get into as well with Diggs. not, and not, and I want to be very clear when I say off field stuff, I'm not talking about like Diggs is a criminal or something like, no, none of that. Like Diggs is just, he's actually seems like a pretty fucking awesome guy off the field and all that stuff. Um, I'm talking more about locker room stuff. We'll, we'll talk about that, but I'd already assumed, okay, he's probably going to get cut after this year, you know, because, at that point, I think we would have had to eat like a $15 million dead cap hit next year. Um, but, you know, you get one more year of digs, and then you eat the $15 million next year, you move on. I think what ended up happening is, I mean, and also we, we had to talk about the entire, it's good we waited to do this, because the fucking details on this digs contract now are ridiculous. Yeah. Yep. Um, so basically, like the last three years of his contract now, the te- the, te- uh, the Texans, like, Washed they voided, off. They voided. They voided. Yeah. They voided it. Um, they paid him three and a half million more. They like added three and a half million to the contract in its last year, I think, or in this season. And now he gets to be a free agent when he hits when at the end of this year. So like, well, I mean, the Texans part of it is still. I, I still kind of like like the bet, depending on some things, but it's a lot less appealing now to me. Anyway. Um, you know, I mean, Diggs, Diggs is the guy who won more so than the Texans or the Bills. Yeah, and and I think for the Bills, it was like, all right, we're going to have to eat this shit. Like, we're going to have to eat some shit one way or another. So we can either, either eat a lot of shit now, and then it's just clean after this year, or we have to – we have Diggs for this year, um, but then we have to eat some shit next year, and we've already positioned ourselves to have a lot of cap space next year. Um, what is more ideal? And I think – Getting that high second, it's going to be a high second from the Vikings um, for 2025's draft. I, I, I really do believe that was like a value at a certain point. And look, I know the Bills gave up a sixth this year and they gave up a fifth next year, whatever. Um, those are picks you can easily recoup and they'll probably get compensatory picks for free agents and stuff like that. So I'm not too worried about that part of it. But I, I just think that value to them was like, all right, if we're going to eat some shit, then this pick is actually worth it to us. It's almost like having a second first, right? It's like the concept of when you get, you know, when this, we do this with like NBA drafts all the time, right? Where we're like, well, that piston second is actually a first round pick because yeah. they're the worst team in the NBA. But it, it is a similar concept. And I do think a lot of like that type of thinking has now entered into the NFL. Um, and like, look, if you, if there's somebody at the end of the first round next year that they love, if they, if they, and that's even if they keep the pick, because I think they might use this pick to trade up this year. Um, but like, if you love somebody at the end of the first round next year, it's a lot easier to do that if you have a high second in your back pocket. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that this is like some master class of management from Brandon Bean, because effectively, like, he had to bite the bullet now because of an extension he gave two years ago to Diggs when he still had two years left on his contract. Now, the argument would be, Diggs is definitely not shy about sharing his feelings. Uh, and I'm sure that part of the understanding when they traded for Diggs from Minnesota was like, Hey, play well, we're going to give you, we're going to take care of you. And if you don't take care of him at that point, Diggs is not a guy who's going to be afraid to be like, um, give me my fucking money. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what it was. So, you know, um, I guess the best way to put it is like if you if you think Diggs is declining, and I do think he's declining, do I think I don't think he's a, a number one anymore. That's the problem. He's not a number one. I think he has the skill set to be a high level two. Uh and honestly, you can like, like he can line up outside still. He can line up inside, which he's always been able to do. That's that's like really what has made him a great receiver, is he's such a technician. Um, you can line them up anywhere, but that like elite, elite level, 
I, I don't I don't think it's there. And you know, like his biggest game last year was that Dolphins game, right? He had a monster game against the Dolphins. If you go back and look at that game, the Dolphins secondary was pretty beat up. I think they had they were starting uh Kohu as their number one corner in that matchup. And he, I mean, that's a ridiculous, that's, that's a joke. Right. Um, but like, if you look at his matchups against elite corners over the last couple of years, aside from Jalen Ramsey at the start of 2022 and Jalen Ramsey, in my opinion, has just, I mean, he, he's not the same player. Um, he was when they won the Super Bowl. he's fallen off pretty strongly in my opinion. Um, like I, I just, He's gotten strapped, man. Like, there's no really no other way to put it. And that KC game in the playoffs, I mean, he, forget the, the drop catch is crazy. I mean, that's you, you can't you can't say some of the shit he might have been saying to Josh and then drop that ball. Um, he fumbled on the first play of the game, which the Bills were fortunate that they just got up and like lined up and, and hiked it real quick. He drops the second like the second play of the game is a throw to him. He drops that. He had a terrible game. But the, the most damning part of it to me is after the game, they were talking to the Chiefs' corners. I think they talked to Legereus Sneed and uh, Trent McDuffie. And they were just kind of asking them like the, about how the game unfolded. And I think McDuffie said something like, uh, they thought, he's like, I think they thought that we were going to double, like double double digs and, and send help, like shade, shade coverage towards him. But we, like, we didn't do that. They just put Legereus Neen on him. And look, I know Legereus Neen had a hell of a year, but you pay a number one receiver to to get advantages in matchups like that. And if he can't do that, and teams know, all right, well, we don't need to shade coverage to this guy, then I think you're probably at a point where you're like, all right, well, if we're going to trade him, this is probably the best value we're going to get. And... So it's like, do we trade him now? Get the pick that, that get a pick of higher value, or play out this year, then cut him after the year and have like a fifty million dead cap hit for next year when we want to be a cap space team. Mm-hmm. So that's the whole calculation, and I guess the pick made it worth it for them. Uh, but again, I'm not sitting here acting like, oh my god, Brandon Bean, you have done wonders on me. <laughs> um, like I, I think he's generally been a great GM, but this is obviously one where, you know, you regretting a past decision and you're just trying to make the best moving forward. Yeah. And with that trading of digs, you made almost $30 million in cap space next season. So 30 million dead cap this year. I mean, you're up against it regardless. You got your cap space now for the draft for some ancillary signings to fill out depth, but you, you go into this draft planning for that plan B for the digs trade. And you shift your focus on stacking up in 2025. So we talked about this off air. Trading digs affected the Bills Super Bowl to, Super Bowl percentages by how much? Five percent chance. Let, let's yeah. Let's let's say five, it's five percent. So is that five percent that you were going to keep this year worth keeping the digs headache in the locker room? First off, second off, delaying your especially essentially your cap space timeline where you can continue to kind of big game hunt and free agency. And then third of all, I believe if they didn't trade digs this off season, he, he would have had a cap hit, a dead cap. It spread across two seasons in 2025 and 2026. Yeah. Not it was as, like, it was like a bigger number in 2025 and then a smaller yeah. one in 2026. I, I believe it was like an 18 million in 2025 and then about 12 million in 2026, which kind of lines up with the 31 that he had this 2024 that uh year in dead money so somewhere along those lines um but seeing the return that they got i think it makes you know all all the all the like financial uh sorry the franchise responsibility things they all line up with this trade especially when you consider looking at this kind of landscape for the older receivers you look at what a guy like Devontae adams got when he was 29 going on 30 and got traded to las vegas I believe the Packers got a first and a third in that trade. And you look at what Keenan Allen went for. First and a second. First and a second. And then you look at what Keenan Allen went for going for a fourth round pick this offseason. Granted, the Chargers had to dump some money. They had to get out of some contracts, but it didn't have to be in that way. And they surveyed the landscape. Keenan Allen got a fourth. 
And he's only two years older than Devontae Adams was when he went for a first and a second. So when you look at things from that lens, I think the Bills were like, okay, it makes more sense for our franchise to bail out right now. And if we wait one year, his price could fall 80%. So it's not something that I think in 10 years people are going to look back on and say, oh, well, that's when it all went wrong when they traded Stephon Diggs. And so, yeah, I mean, like I said, I think they had to, they were going to move on either now or in a year like that. That was, and and this is not like, this was, you can go and follow, follow big bills accounts on Twitter. And almost like that was kind of the universal like belief. It was like, all right, well, unless Diggs has a huge bounce back here, you know, this is probably it. It's probably the last year and that's fine. It is what it is. Um, but you know, I'm just I'm just okay with it because I'll be quite honest, like I'm just I was kind of like sick of all the bullshit off the off the field with him where you're like he's like like it's like dude get up like it's fine if I am constantly shit posting on Twitter. Why are you <laughs> constantly shit posting on Twitter? Why are you being cryptic? Why are you like you know wh- why are you berating like you want to get mad at Josh Allen? I have no problem with that. Like, there's no reason to really, like, do shit like that on the sideline. And, and I want to be clear, like, it'd be one thing if Josh was a guy that, like, is on the sideline, like, doing the Brady-type stuff or, or pay in where you're, like, yelling at your guys. Like, I've never really seen that at all from Josh. Like, if he's doing that, it's more like a pump-up. It's not, you you fucking missed that block. What the fuck? Like, it, it's not that shit. He's just not that type of, you know, that's, like, not how he acts on the sideline. Um so for Diggs to do that to him in that in that AFC, you know, what is it, divisional round game against the Bengals, I mean, that was a big deal. That was like, obviously, that's a national game. Everybody's watching. It's the only game at the time, uh, on at that time. And it was a game that people were locked in on. And for that to happen in that situation is not a great look. Um, and, you know, there's there's a lot of shit. You can go through all the stuff over the last couple of years with, with Diggs, and it's like, you know, he's, he's got his brother tweeting like how bad Buffalo is and how he needs to get out of there. And it's like, you know, do I, do I think that necessarily reflects poorly on Stefan Diggs? No, but at the same time, it's like, why are these people who are close to you? Why, why do they keep indicating like that? That's weird. It is weird when people that are that close to your fucking brother is like comfortable just shitting on the team and the city that you play for. Um, that's a, that's a, it's odd. It is odd. There's no other way around. That's very fucking weird. And like, you know, there's the stuff with Josh. And I mean, I, I can say this, but I'm not reporting anything to you. I'm just, I mean, there are probably people that are not, I mean, they're not, most people that are listening to this are not Bills fans. Um, so like, you know, if you, if you're like locked in, like I am to Bill stuff, you know, uh, one cover one, they do really great work on their live stream after the, uh, the trade initially went down. Eric Turner, who runs the site, and he, he's great. He's super awesome. Even if you're not a Bills fan, it's definitely worth a follow. Um, he he was he he basically reported that you know after they they had had some mix up during that divisional round game in, in the, against the Bengals. That's what initiated the blow up. And I guess it was a route that they had worked on during the week. And um, you know, I guess Allen had told them like, forget the route, just whatever the lev- read the leverage, and I'll hit you whatever it is, right? So it's like, even if it, if the play is supposed to be for an outside release, if the leverage is telling you it's an inside release, just play the leverage and I'll find you. Whatever happened on that play was a mix-up. I guess Diggs told Allen when they were going to the sideline, like, basically, like, what's your excuse now, Josh? Like, what is your excuse now? Like, you're just making these excuses. Like, what's your excuse? And, you know, obviously Josh handled it however he handled it. I don't think he really even reacted to what Diggs was saying at that in that moment anyway on the sideline. Um and then I guess after, I mean, this, and this actually got reported by Tim Graham, who writes for the athletic today on a podcast. He mentioned that after the first game this week, right? So you got to remember bill season ends. They lose to the Bengals. All right. Personally, I, I think that that team was just emotionally and sh- they were just shot in a lot of ways with the whole DeMar Hamlin thing and all the shit they had to deal with that year. Um, they have opening game of the season against the Jets. And it's this huge buildup, right? Aaron Rodgers debut. Rodgers gets hurt, and everybody in and their mom is running to FanDuel to live bet the Bills. Um, 
Allen plays a terrible game. One of it was just, it's just an awful game. Uh, forcing throws, stupid plays, whatever. After the game, I guess you know he's sitting at his locker and everybody's just kind of like coming up to him, like patting him on the back, like you know it's early. In the, it's the first game of the season, right? It's like all right, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. He's obviously not feeling great about himself. Um, and again, this is just what Tim Graham said. Uh, he said that he saw Diggs go over to him. He doesn't know what what Diggs said to him, but he heard Josh just say like it's been one fucking game. Um, so they clearly had some tension and friction going on between them. I don't know that they hated each other, but it was not the hunky dory feeling they had a couple of years prior. Um, and I don't know when the hell that started happening, but it did. And I also know for sure, like, I know that Diggs was unhappy about certain things in their offense initially. He also had the weird thing this year, remember, where he didn't go to OTAs and McDermott was like, uh, you know, it's um, it's always concerning if he's not here because he's one of our best players, something like that. He had a lot of there, there's just a lot of weird things going on with him, and I also think it's weird that like of the guys on our team, like you know, a guy gets traded. You know, business is business, right? So I, I would imagine that part of Diggs' desire to leave Buffalo is maybe he just wanted to get out of Buffalo, maybe he wasn't going to go with Allen, but also I think he might have been like, I want an opportunity to get a new contract, and. You know, obviously that was the Texans clearly like when he got straight into the Texans, I guarantee you they were like, he's like, I want an extension. And they were like, go fuck yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so, so like, whatever. Um, it's, it's all very weird and confusing. And, and I, I, I personally just think it was like, you, you can be an asshole. A lot of players are assholes. A lot of great players are assholes. But, you can be an asshole up until you're no longer worth worth it. If I have to deal with you being like if if Jalen Brunson is a gigantic asshole, I will deal with it. I will <laughs> like and that will be I it's just something you gotta deal with. The moment but if, if it's 2022 Julius Randall. Right. Like, it's you're just no. like, are you fucking kidding me? Like the yeah. get this shit out of here. Um, and that's, and that's what it kind of was at the end of this year. We were like watching digs and I'm like, dude, can, can you like, can you, he had like no explosive plays in the last basically eight weeks. I mean, he had one big catch against Miami in the last game of the season, Yeah. but the playoffs, he, I mean, he had, it was, it was just not good. He didn't do anything. And then you compare that to like Shakir and yeah, look, I, I am, I'm positive that Shakir was benefiting from the fact that. Whether the Chiefs were doubling him or not, he clearly is always going to have a little bit more attention as, as currently is um, than Diggs is. But Shakir, you watch some of the catches and plays he's making in that Kansas City game. I mean, it's not really. I don't even think you can. I don't think you can argue it. He he literally made more impact plays in the playoffs in that game than Diggs did in four years. That's and that's like, like you know, again, you want to be an asshole, fine. He's always been productive in the regular season. Did not show up big in playoff games. You want to say that's because he's getting double covered and whatever. Okay, but I see all their great receivers get double covered and show up in playoff games. Yeah. Like that's part of your that's part of the job. That's part and of being a number one receiver. Also broke off that game winning touchdown against the Steelers. Oh yeah. Sha I mean, Shakir's fucking he's awesome, man. Like he he's great. And then you see Kincaid emerging too. Kincaid, the back half. You remember the first half of the year it was like, oh my God, did they know what they're doing with this guy? Look at Sam Laporta in Detroit. And then you watch the back half of the year and you're like, you know, look, he's not he's not Kelsey because Kelsey is fucking like he's own thing. He, yeah, he, he's the greatest pass catching tight end as far as I'm concerned ever. Um, but like like he is that type of a tight end where you can get him the rock in space and he can get you, he can make guys miss or run through guys or whatever. And then, you know, his route running and the fact that you can line him up all over the field and, you know, he's not like a dominant blocker, but he's, he wasn't like a terrible blocker. He was fine. Um, you know, you watch those two guys emerge, you see cook, right? I mean, cook had a monster year and you can argue he underwhelmed in some ways because he dropped like, I mean, he's a great pass catcher. He had a bad pass catching year. And even then his numbers look spectacular. Um, so, I don't know. When you see these emerging guys, and then you're like, okay, we have this is a loaded wide receiver draft, which we're going to talk about. Yeah. It, it, if you're going to do it again, it's like, all right, maybe this is just 
This is it. And and you know what? If Josh is like, look, let's put it this way: if Diggs wanted, if Allen wanted Diggs to be on the roster, and was like wholly against, like if he was like, no, that's my guy, you can't do it, he'd fucking be a bill. There's no way he's not on the team if D- if Allen is like, if they go to Allen and they're like, hey, we're gonna trade Diggs, he'd be, and he's like, what are you fucking talking about? No, you're not. Then he'd be a, he'd be on the Bills. But clearly, Allen was not exactly fighting or, or something for the guy. Yeah. Uh, just seems like things ran their course. And I don't think anybody should be – like like the way you are. I, I know you don't have any malice or whatever the word may be towards Diggs on, and like how things have been handled because he gave you legit wide receiver on production. And the Bills now did right by themselves. Diggs did right by himself. He's going to get a new contract this offseason. And – People are going to move on. Um, I think that's pretty much every every point touched on that digs as a topic over there. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't I, I'm not even honestly like the way I th- I felt was like I think there are people that were like I had so many people that are like oh my god like are you how do you feel like this is crazy and I was just kind of like after all the details came out I was just like it's yeah. fine yeah. it's fine. It is like this was not, uh, you know, this is not like trading for OG. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. And one of the things that hit my mind, just because I was talking about um, the Jags and their situation after losing Calvin Ridley with somebody, both of these teams now, the Bills and the Jags, could be uh, in competition for Brandon Ayuk, depending on what happens with the draft over there. Uh, we God knows how many fucking comp picks the Niners have every year. And with that, you know, they could maneuver, they could trade up for a receiver if they really want to, and they can bank some capital, save some money by trading Brandon Ayuk. Um, if the Bills are interested, I don't think there's a better kind of like trade off or kind of transition because of the way that Diggs wins and the way that Ayuk wins. I think they're very similar. And I think honestly, Ayuk is. A bigger and potentially better version of him right now than Diggs was when he went to Buffalo when he was 26 years old. So the price for him is probably a one and a three somewhere in that ballpark. If I was the Bills, I'd gladly pay that and I'd gladly pay him because I think Ayuk is in a full time role as a wide receiver, one who's seeing whatever it is 170 targets a year. I think he's a top five talent in the position. I think. When when there's when there's so many metrics that line up and put you among the Tyree Kills and you know the Keenan Allens and the Devontae Adams and Justin Jeffersons, Jamar Chases of the world, you look at stuff like um receiving yards per team pass attempt, receiving yards, um uh, of a team market share of pass of receiving yards, you look at first downs per reception, he's elite and consistently top ten, top five in all those metrics. So Getting out of San Francisco, out of kind of having to split wide receiver one duties with D- with Debo and Kittle and CMC every week, that's a guy who could really pop. And honestly, if you tell me right now he goes to Buffalo and has 100 catches for 1,500 yards and 10 touchdowns next year, I fully believe that. I, I think he is one of the elite wide receivers in this league just waiting to blossom and cool. just go, like Dave Gettleman said, in full bloom love with him. Like he's great, a fucking great. Guy. The great football mind that David Gettleman is. Um, no, I mean, Ayuk's situation is not he, – okay, he, it's not the same thing. I don't think he's like – I don't think Ayuk is necessarily angling to leave San Francisco. I think he just no, wants to no, get paid. No, no. He just wants to get paid. Um, but, like, his situation is not that far off from what Diggs was in Minnesota where it was like, yeah, I'm good and people know I'm good, but I could be better. I can I can do more. I can be a number one. I can be featured in a like I think the 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 Niners ran the ball more than anybody in football last year, right? Naturally, uh, if yeah. not top one, at least you know top right. five. So like, you take a guy like Ayuk, and then you put him into a Bills offense or any offense for that matter, where you're going to throw the ball around a lot more. Um, I mean. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't doubt that he can do more. I, I think I've seen enough from him. And the other thing with Ayuk that I love, he's so physical. Um, he'll block like he and he's he's one of these guys like after the catch, he kind of. I'm not saying I'm not. He's not like Earl Campbell or something, but he he's happy to 
to run through guys, not go down, not just like, like, and I, I don't, you know, Diggs was actually amazing at protecting himself. Like, I don't think I've ever seen that guy take a monster hit. And I actually mean that as a credit. I'm not saying that he was scared to go across the middle. I'm saying he knew, like, he knew how to protect himself while still being an elite pass catcher. Ayuk is different than that. Um, but he's also, like, it feels like they, Brady wants more yak. Like, you know, we saw them throw all these wide receiver screens at Diggs. And you could tell Diggs was like, I, this is not what I do, bro. Like, I'm not trying to fucking break through, like, a two on three here for eight yards. Like I'm, that's not what we do. Like I'm not that player. I'm a technician. You give me routes to run. I read it. I get open. I don't fucking do bubble screens and try to take that shit to the house. That is not my game. 